My name is Lynn Marie, and I taught in elementary classrooms for years. Now, I work with 240 to help teachers pass their certification exams. And today, I'm going to help you. This video is going to prepare you for the Praxis Core reading exam. That's test code 5713. This video is going to cover three things. What's on the test and how it's structured, the most likely concepts that will be on the test, and we're going to look at a few practice questions. Ready? Let's go. Now, the practice core reading exam consists of 56 total questions that come from three overarching categories. The categories are key ideas and details, craft, structure, and language skills, and integration of knowledge and ideas. Each category has an outline of what to expect, but as you'll see in just a minute, they're still pretty overwhelming. Thankfully, we've taken care of the research for you, and we have everything you need in our study guide. But we'll go ahead and talk about some need to knows right now. Oh, before we dive into category one, I want to mention that this is a passage-based exam. This means that you'll read passages of various lengths and answer questions related to that passage. Sometimes you'll see one question per passage and other times multiple questions will be tied to the same passage or set of passages. Okay, on to category one. The first category we'll look at is key ideas and details. It's worth 35% of your exam. You'll see anywhere between 17 and 22 questions on your test from this section. The big things you're going to see here include identifying the main idea and primary purpose, supporting ideas, and inferences. First things first, anytime you're given a passage, you will want to identify the main idea and the primary purpose. In every reading, those are two key takeaways that will help you with your understanding of the text. Let's go over the differences. A main idea is the central point of the passage. It might be clearly stated or you might need to infer it. A primary purpose is why the author wrote the work. You often have to infer this. Now, you'll definitely see questions that ask you about this directly, but for every passage, it's usually the best first step. Determining the main idea and primary purpose will help you fully analyze the text and prepare you to answer the other types of questions about it, like questions about supporting ideas. Do you like the little segue I did there? Supporting ideas are specific focused arguments or details that support the main idea of a passage. What are the best ways to identify supporting ideas? I'm so glad you asked. Find the specific reference in the passage and reread it. This is often presented as a noun in the question. What is said about it? A common distractor is the main idea of the entire passage. Remember, supporting idea questions are much more focused. Eliminate anything not directly stated in the passage. You're not inferring or drawing a conclusion here. We'll talk about that next. And also, make sure to eliminate anything contradicting the main idea of the passage. Last one in this category, inferences. When you make an inference, you form an idea about the passage using statements and facts directly given. This is also known as an educated guess. We have plenty of tips about how to do this in the guide, but I'm going to go ahead and let you in on one right now, and it's a good one. Ask yourself why the author wrote the passage. If the author has an opinion about the subject, what is it? If you understand how the author feels about the subject, you are on your way to understanding what they imply. All right, those are the key ideas and important details about the key ideas and details. Let's head over to category two. The craft, structure, and language skills category makes about 30% of your exam, or between 14 and 19 total questions. In this category, you're going to work with attitude and tone, mm-hmm, organization and structure, meaning of words, and fact and opinion. That may sound like a lot, because it is, but we have plenty of practice for you in our 240 study guide. Right now though, I'm ready to talk about your attitude. Just kidding. But we do need to discuss how to identify an author's attitude. How authors feel about the subject they are writing about often comes out in their work. Let's take a look at how descriptive language can help us identify an author's attitude. The aroma of roasted Brussels sprouts drifted through the house. 
In that sentence, we can assume that the author enjoys eating Brussels sprouts based on the word choice of aroma and drifted. Both of these words have a positive connotation. Now let's look at another example. The stench of roasted Brussels sprouts overwhelmed the house. The second sentence uses words like stench, overwhelmed, which feel negative. And we can assume the author does not like Brussels sprouts. It's a negative connotation. How do you feel about Brussels sprouts? Me personally, I am a fan, especially with some bacon, balsamic, mm, but I digress. Let's move on to organization and structure. You'll likely need to recognize how an author organizes their writing and why. When we analyze organization, we're identifying how the author constructs the passage or how paragraphs relate to one another. Sometimes the key is to focus on the order in which the material in the passage is presented. Sequential order is an orderly progression of events, ideas, or steps. Authors often use sequential order when they explain a process. Chronological order is an orderly progression of events based on time. This is typically used when an author walks us through a particular period in history. Sometimes, authors arrange the writing by order of importance by starting or ending the writing piece with the most important claim. Look for terms like most importantly near the top or the bottom of the passage. Spatial order is an arrangement of ideas related to physical space. Think of positions. Authors may use this technique when they keep ideas together based on geography. Authors may also organize their writing using text structures and reinforce logic and reasoning skills. When authors organize their writing by cause and effect, they describe an event and follow the description with a possible outcome. Ask yourself, did the author explain what would happen after something else occurred? Now, problem solution text structure is a type of organization in which the author poses a problem and then provides answers or ideas about how to solve it. Claim and refutation is a type of organization in which the author argues against a statement factor claim. Look for the author to provide a statement, use the words however or in fact, and then provide counter arguments and you will be able to identify this type of structure. Compare and contrast is a different type of organization in which the author provides similarities and differences about two ideas. For example, pros and cons. I know that's a lot to remember, but remember this. We've got tons of opportunities for you to practice in our 240 study guide. Ready to check out the meaning of words portion of this category? We've got a great video on this in our guide. Let's take a look. You can also use syntactic or semantic clues to determine the meaning of a word. Think about the placement of a given word in the sentence, is it a verb? Adjective. Let's practice this with an example. My ornery big brother yelled at me when I walked in front of the TV while he was playing video games. In this sentence, a reader who recognizes that the word ornery is an adjective used to describe the author's big brother could then use the context clue yelled at me to infer that ornery means something negative. Another strategy is to try to read the phrase of the passage and substitute in each answer choice you are provided. Which one makes the most sense? Let's try it out with the sentence we just saw. We already determined that ornery must mean something negative based on how it's used in the sentence. Let's substitute in our choices and see which one works the best. My brave big brother yelled at me. That doesn't make much sense. My dynamic big brother yelled at me. That doesn't work. My considerate big brother yelled at me. That's an obvious wrong choice we can eliminate. My ill-tempered big brother yelled at me. That makes sense, and it's definitely the best choice to pick. So helpful, right? That was Mike, just one of the many all-star tutors we've got in our guide. Our team is here to help you prepare and pass. And right now, I'm going to help you know what to expect for the fact or opinion portion of this category. 
let's talk about opinions. Sometimes the author will directly let you know they're stating an opinion. Look for phrases like I believe or I think. Opinions use qualifying words or terms. Qualifiers modify the meaning of words. These can come before or after by limiting it or enhancing them. Some examples are very, usually, always, and never. Let's look at some examples. Here's the first one. It's my belief that lack of sleep disturbs the body's digestive processes. The author directly tells us in that sentence that it is a belief, not a fact. Opinion. Let's look at another one. Van Gogh is by far the greatest painter of his time. By far the greatest, it is a qualifying phrase that modifies the relative quality of Van Gogh. This is how the author feels about Van Gogh and cannot be proven. Opinion. Let's look at another one. The benefits from vitamins and minerals and fruits far outweigh the negatives of their sugar content. That phrase, far outweigh, modifies the magnitude of the benefits. So, opinion. Here's a good one. Kids never love broccoli. The use of the word never makes this statement an opinion. While kids are known to be picky eaters, there are some kids out there who definitely love broccoli. First Brussels sprouts, now broccoli? This script writer must really want us to make sure we're getting our vegetables in. Okay, enough about food and this category. That's it for category two. Let's move on to our last category, integration of knowledge and ideas. Just like the first category, this one makes up 35% of your exam, which is about 17 to 22 questions. You'll see questions about diverse media and formats, evaluation of arguments, and analysis and comparison of text. Clear as mud. <laughs> Let's dig some more. Diverse media and formats means that you'll need to interpret text that include visual representations. These are things like charts and graphs. Not too bad, right? And remember, we have plenty of practice questions with these in our study guide. The evaluation of arguments portion in this category is all about analyzing evidence, determining assumptions, and drawing conclusions. Let's put some tips in our back pockets for drawing conclusions from a passage. Your conclusion must logically follow the information from the passage. Stay within the parameters of the passage. Make sure your answer choice doesn't take part of the logical conclusion and twist it further than what the original passage intends. Try it out by inserting the conclusion you selected at the end of the passage, then ask yourself, does it flow? Watch out for qualifying words such as best, only, never, always, and choices. These often limit or make the conclusion false. We will have a chance to apply these tips in just a bit with a practice question. But for right now, let's talk about one more portion in this category. When analyzing and comparing text, you will need to recognize similar ideas in situations, apply ideas to other situations, and recognize points of agreement and disagreement between two pair texts. You're likely to see pair passages for a portion of the section of the test. What does that mean? This means you'll work with two passages to answer questions instead of one. And that's it. We've gone through all the categories. Are you feeling dialed in? Now that we've gone over some of the big concepts in our three areas, let's look at some practice questions to show you how these concepts can appear on the test. If you want a lot of practice questions, you can click that plan to pass below. It will help you identify how to get started with your studies and where to go from there. Did I mention the 240 study guide has a money back guarantee that you'll pass? Now for the questions. Just like you'll do on the real exam, let's read a passage and then answer questions about it. The age of exploration marked a new frontier for sea navigation. This epoch began in the 15th century when Portugal and Spain started to expand their commercial interests and trade routes across the oceans, resulting in the exchange of goods and sometimes even traditions. Sailors used new technologies to navigate across the world, including a device called the quadrant, a fan-shaped magnetic object that measured the altitude of stars, the moon, and the sun in order to determine the latitude of a ship. 
Another device was the compass, which used Earth's magnetic poles to point navigators north, south, east, or west. Timekeeping devices like hourglasses were important in calculating how far and how fast a ship had sailed. Early navigators also used maps, although these were not always accurate and were often written during the course of the exploration. These maps were then improved upon with new explorations. With these new technologies, the success of the age of exploration was unparalleled. Since it's always a good place to start, let's answer a question about the main purpose of this passage. Question one, the author's main purpose in this selection is, A, to explain the importance of the compass, B, to introduce the tools that made the age of exploration a success, C, to discuss Spain's influence on exploration, or D, to describe the age of exploration. Now, at first, when I was reading these answer choices, I thought D was the correct answer. But I can see with the study guide's real-time feedback that I need to try again. Of course, it's B. It's definitely the one we want. Although the author does mention the age of exploration, the majority of the passage is spent discussing the tools of exploration. Ready to make an inference? According to the information presented in this selection, it is reasonable to infer that which technology was the least helpful to sailors during this period. Hmm, let's think on this. The author never directly states this, but you and I can both infer that maps were the least helpful to sailors because the author does let us know that maps were not always accurate and were often written during the course of the exploration. We made a logical leap there for sure. Okay. Now let's look at another type of question. This is to determine the meaning of a word from the passage. Which of the following best defines the word on parallel? Perpendicular, groundbreaking, revolution, or minimal? Remember the context matters. Think to yourself, where was on parallel used? Why did the author use it? Choice B is the best. Overall, the author is conveying that the age of exploration brought a new world of technologies. Therefore, the success would be new groundbreaking on parallel. Last up, let's draw a conclusion. Which of the following conclusions is best supported by the passage? Your conclusion should be a logical summary of the passage. The main idea here is to express to the reader why 15th century exploration was a success. Multiple technologies are listed and described, which makes the the best choice. Choice A is a direct contradiction of what the passage says. And both A and C, they both focus too narrowly on one piece of technology. Choice B, while possibly historically accurate, cannot be verified with the information given in the passage. Remember, conclusions should always be based on what is directly supported by the text. <sighs> Now that's just a small sliver of practice questions to give you an idea about how these concepts are assessed on the test. Congratulations on finishing the video. If you found it helpful, give it a like. Now there's still plenty more to learn. That you know that thousands of teachers have passed their certification exams using our study guides. If you really want to make sure you're prepared for the practice score reading exam, Take the next step now and subscribe to the 240 Guide. It has hours of videos that you can even watch while doing chores. But most importantly, it is test aligned, so you know precisely what you need to study. It has hundreds of practice questions, so you can be sure you're going to be ready. So click the link below right now to get started.